Greeting Earthlings! If you follow the channel, you know that we restored the genuine Apollo Guidance computer back to full functionality in a mere 24 episodes. The Apollo Guidance computer, or AGC for short, was the revolutionary computer from the mid-1960s that guided the Apollo Command module and the LEM to the moon and back. The first computer to use integrated circuits, the first computer to implement fly-by-wire, of a moonbound spacecraft while they were at it, with robust real-time software that could recover nearly instantly from a crash. A genius machine and a historical milestone for computing. In fact, we got it working so well that we could actually fly landings with it, using the ByteXact original Apollo 11 LEM software. The program had been previously recovered from an original listing from the Draper Labs collection now on display at the MIT Museum. But that's the exception rather than the rule. There are a few precious other listings remaining, mostly thanks to Don Isles, one of the original programmers of the AGC, who had the foresight to preserve a few of his own and kept them safe for several decades. For example, this Apollo 12 listing, which fortunately found its way to our restoration lead Mike Stewart, who then scanned it, transcribed it, corrected it with the help of internet volunteers until it recompiled to give the byte exact result. It sounds simple as I tell the story here, but this was the culmination of several years of work. Sadly, most of the software that was run on the AGC has no remaining printout and is lost to history. So as soon as we got our AGC up and running, we rushed to recover the software from an AGC we knew all too well the one on display at the Computer History Museum. We hoped that the original software that was run on this AGC was still locked in its permanent core rope memory. Core rope memory, you said. What is that? That's where the AGC programs were physically stored in the computer. They had no small enough hard disks, silicon ROM ICs had not been invented yet, and much less flash memory. But they had magnetic core memory. This memory was made of minuscule ferrite core beads that were threaded onto an array of thin wires. We have several videos on how these work and I link them in the doodly doo. The AGC used four kilobytes of core memory for its RAM and that module caused us major trouble during the restoration. But we eventually made it work and like flash memory, Ferrite core memory is retained even without power. And indeed, we were able to read the content of our RAM after 50 years. So you could have loaded and kept your programs in this traditional ferrite core memory. But although the AGC's ferrite core memory was very dense for its time, it was still not dense enough. And since it was writable, or erasable as they say, there was always a risk that you could corrupt it. So, to store the programs, the AGC used a related but quite different type of core memory, called the core rope memory. Core rope memory is read-only and is much denser, two attributes that were perfect for what AGC calls fixed memory. Core rope memory uses far bigger cores than regular ferrite memory. It uses the orange core on the left of the picture here, which is positively giant compared to the minuscule ferrite cores used in the traditional core memory, shown to the right of it. They are so big that you can thread hundreds of wires into a single core and achieve higher bit densities. It's quite a complicated memory scheme that we will explain in more details in a minute, but for now, let's simplify greatly and say that ones or zeros are encoded by threading a wire through or around a core. So the program was literally woven in and around these large ferrite cores with thousands and thousands of wires. It created large ropes of wires meandering around the cores, hence the name core rope memory. Once packaged, a core memory module held 12 kilobytes of memory and there were six slots for these in the computer for a grand total of 72 kilobytes of memory which might not sound like much and really wasn't, but was far more than the traditional core memory module used for the RAM, which held only four kilobytes. Core rope was also very robust, immune to attempts to rewrite it, 
cosmic rays or most electronic glitches. Back at the museum, under the watchful eyes of nervous curators, we removed the core rope modules containing the precious software and first started testing them pin by pin for continuity. We then slid them in our restore computer, read and archived the contents. There were some tense moments after we discovered that some blocks of words had parity errors, but after an hour of computer gymnastics, Mike and Ken managed to recover the missing bits. We were able to immediately run the recovered software in front of the very relieved museum people. It turns out this was an important version of the AGC checkout code and one that had been lost to history. Well, it was lost no more. Mike then went on a personal quest to use our restored AGC to read as many core rope modules as he could get into his sticky hands. Some were loaned to us by Don Isles himself, the programmer that had made the Apollo 11 printout, some by the computer's chief engineer, Eldon Hall, who has sadly passed away since then at the age of 98. Some were loaned to us by the MIT Museum, and we even got some through the auction house RR Auction, which had an incoming AGC for sale, but let us read the core rope modules before it was sold. Kudos to our auction. But eventually, it was our AGC turn to be sold at Sotheby's this time. By the way, this was not a surprise at all, as Jimmy Locke, our AGC's owner, who is a person of very modest means, had planned to sell it all along. Actually, we were quite happy for him that it sold for triple the price of any previous AGC. We'd like to think that's because it was now the only functional one in the world. And we never heard back from its new owner. So with our AGC gone for now into a black hole, we had just lost our ability to read more core rope modules and recover more AGC software. Bummer. But that was not going to stop Mike. He decided to take the matter into his own hands. And one day he showed up at the lab with a new contraption prototype. Hello, Mike. Hello. You've made a new contraption. Yes. It's a, a test version of a larger contraption. <laughs> and it's uh, going to be a core rope reader? Yes. Uh, so since the AGC that we restored uh, has been auctioned off, we no longer have access sold. to it. It was sold. Um, we currently don't have a way to read core rope memories. Uh, and so I am building a portable core rope reader that I can just throw in my backpack and take to, uh, you know, wherever the core rope memories are, which solves problems that we had, you know, just logistics problems of how do we get the ropes and the AGC in the same place at the same time. <laughs> and uh, in your prototype circuit, you have wired a rope. Yes. With a whole bunch of bits. Uh, it's only two cores, but by the miracle of core ropes, my, my head explodes every time we go through the <laughs> explanation. You store a bunch of bits per core, which is the whole idea. So you immediately notice the large number of wires for just two cores. We'll explain what they do in painful detail later, but to give you a taste, the blue wires are used for addressing, the yellow and white wires are for the data and storing the bits, the red is the core set wire and the black is the core reset wire. This odd arrangement allows to store many bits per core. And in the end, did, did it store? Uh, they did 12 words per core. Uh, so 12 16 bit words per core got them up to 192 bits of storage per core. Per core, which is incredibly dense and she's why it, they use that, although it's really complicated compared to core memory. <laughs> and on your board, what do you do have to make that work here? You have reproduced some circuitry that was kind of faithful to the original? Yeah, so a lot of this is identical to what's in the actual Apollo Guidance computer. Uh -huh. um, some of it I was able to simplify because I'm only reading one module at a time instead of six. This, this row of circuits here, um, each one of these is a 225 milliamp blue wire inhibit driver. For depressing the cores and preventing them from flipping. Yep. Yeah. Uh, these two up here are 450 milliamp set and reset dri uh, drivers. So they're from your red wire and your black wire. Yep. And then these circuits in the middle here are what drive the diode selection 
um, to pick out either the white or yellow. Oh, you have a little FPGA in the corner? Oh yeah. That flips the signal. Yeah, this is just sort of implements the waveforms that I need to play to to synchronize all the circuits and the, the strobe to the sense right. amplifier. It all happens and gives you the bits you read, right? Yeah. That, uh... so you click read and uh, the the information that I wired into the rope with the white and yellow wires was one three two one, and that's what we're reading. This um, this the, the, this top yellow wire is the twos position. Okay. Um, and I'll put this through this core, uh, which will make our address three, uh, three instead of a one. So we can... it'll, it'll change at the end here. This, this one at the end should become a three. Okay, do your magic. It did. <laughs> <laughs> the magic of core rope. And then you can't hack it. Right. <laughs> it's in there. Yep, and you'd have to go in and change the wiring, which they did actually, right? You <laughs> told me on the Ap uh, Apollo Eleven. That yeah, that is a cr that is a crazy story that has been so, forgotten so, to history. So but... tell us the crazy story of the Apollo Eleven last minute <laughs> rope change that saved the mission. Really, they found a a very very serious bug in Luminary on June eighteenth. Luminary, which is the LEM code right. to the landing code. Yeah, so June 18th they found this bug that was like potential loss of crew level of bug in the software. Uh -huh. um, and there there were a couple of workarounds uh, that they ran past the crew and Neil Armstrong didn't like any of them. Mm -hmm. um, so they decided to try to make a software change in time for launch, which was, you know, less than a month away. Mm -hmm. If the bug kicked in, um, the, the guidance in the lunar module just mm -hmm. stops working for 163 seconds. There's a small chance of the bug happening. If the bug does happen, there's probably about a 20% chance that the, the LEM will start tumbling head over, like end over end. So it becomes uncontrollable. Yeah. There's a couple different ways that the bug can happen, but the way that they found it to happen is if you hit the abort button. Which like, if you're in a scenario where you want to hit the abort yeah, button and then suddenly it just starts tumbling, it's, it's not good. And so Armstrong insisted it to be corrected. Yes. Um, and so Raytheon had been building up the flight spare set of luminary modules and they had it completely wired, but they hadn't potted it yet. Oh, because we have to say it takes three months for the ladies. Yes. To wire yeah. to and do, it's, it's to less than a month thing. until launch. So they reworked the module? Yeah. Better? So they, they had to find the sense wires that uh -huh. they had to change, uh -huh. cut them and uh -huh terminate the ends mm -hmm. and then put new sense wires to replace those through um, to, to fix the bug. It was, it was only two memory locations had to change. Um, oh, okay. It was a very, very surgical fix. They had to crawl inside the, the Saturn V while it was on mm -hmm. the pad, inside the lunar module, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, take out the, the one rope module that changed and plug in the new one. Uh, okay, well, that was a good fix. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to ask, so how many have you recovered so far? Read, retread 50 from the Computer History Museum. Mm -hmm. We got Sundial E from the MIT Museum. Mm -hmm. And then between Don Isles and Eldon Hall, we got seven different modules of various versions of Sundance mm -hmm. for Apollo mm -hmm. 9. Um, then you, you got the ones that from the uh, AGC that got sold. I was including, that's included okay. in that mm -hmm. seven figure. Mm -hmm. That they let us read before they sold it. Yep. Right, so that was very nice of them. Mm -hmm. We have Apollo 11 complete. We have Apollo 12. We're missing the command module ropes, but those are some that I'm hoping to be able to read with this. Later. So Mike, Yes. I see your contraption seems to be done. It's. I think it's done. It's finished. Have you tested it yet with uh, actual ropes? No, I have installed in it right now uh, one of the rope jumpers that we used on the real AGC, uh -huh. um, just to you know do full power tests. Mm -hmm. uh, it reads all zeros from the jumper correctly. Okay. So. <laughs> and I see 
From a Jerry's collector, we have a few ropes. We yeah. have one out of the back, back there. Yep. Which is that one? This is module B4 from Luminary 69, uh -huh. which is, you know, what flew on Apollo 10. We don't have it yet? We do have that one. So, um, so you're going to use that to check that you can read correctly? Yep. So good. Okay. So it takes in 14 volts to match the um, the AGC. The AGC. Yep. Uh, I have a hot swap controller at the front to do protection. So now that I've clicked this button, I actually have 14 volts on the rope. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna open this. Um, this is the the timing window for the waveforms that I'm applying to the rope. Mm -hmm. So if I need to adjust things, I can push them around by hundreds of nanoseconds. So if I click this button, it'll mm -hmm. go through the whole thing. Go for a dump. And it's not completely happy. There's blocks where we're missing the whole block. You're reading A correctly, but not B, I think. 777 is good. 200 is not good. Which, what happens if I try to read from 200? Am I doing my inhibit wrong? I bet you I'm calculating the parity wire incorrectly. Block 2 has a design flaw with its parity wire that I think I may, may have fallen in, into the trap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I need to... So is that something they didn't realize and they had to work around later? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they realized really, really late in the Block 2 design after they were already building hardware. They basically had to start using some of the reset wires as additional inhibits because the parity scheme didn't fully work the way they intended. <laughs> yeah. Core memory is complicated enough, but core rope is an order, another order of magnitude above it. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, Mike has hit one of the finer points of core rope memory addressing, the parity wires. In fact, core rope memory is so complicated that even its inventors got it wrong. So we need to spool up the elevator music and try to explain it. We'll start with the part that everybody gets, the data wires. Let's say we have a modest 8 cores of memory representing addresses 0 to 7. We want to store a 16-bit word in each of these locations. For that we are going to use 16 thin wires, one wire per bit. If a wire goes through a core, it's a one at that location. So right now, we made a rope with all ones at all addresses, reading FFFF everywhere in hexadecimal. Now let's kick a few wires off the cores. When a wire goes around a core, it represents a zero. So locations zero and one now contain FF00. Locations two and three contain FFF0. The four last locations are still FFFF. Note that the AGC designers would have used octal instead, so they would have read 177777. But hex is far easier to read, so I'll bend history a little bit. Anyhow, the data encoding principle is easy enough to follow. Obviously, we need a way to detect if a wire goes through a core or not. So we connect the two ends of each data wire to a sense amplifier. The sense amplifier is a very sensitive wire current detector. We demonstrated such a circuit in our previous videos. In the AGC, it was implemented with the very first analog IC ever, the very first integrated differential comparator. Now comes the tough bit. We need a way to interrogate each core individually so we can differentiate between addresses. And that's where it gets complicated. 
Well, actually, there is a very simple way to do that, which you probably thought of already. Although that is not how the core rope memory works, let's look at it first. We just put a small excitation coil on each core and put an AC voltage in one of them when we want to read that core. Then, if the core were made out of iron, for example, it would act as a transformer, with the excitation coil being the primary and the data wires going through the core counting as single turn secondaries. We'll get a small AC current induced on each data wire that goes through the core, and when we sample our sense amplifiers, the bits should come out. This is a perfectly legit scheme, so much so that it has a name. It is called Transformer Read-Only Storage, or TROS. It was used by weird Soviet phone dialers, and even IBM for their 360 computers. And even better, gleefully misused by Luke Mano Computer to make a genius drum machine. But Transformer memory is bulky, and the addressing scheme does not scale for large memories. The reason IBM and the Soviets used it was because TROS was cheap. So our Apollo core rope is not a transformer memory, nor are the cores made out of transformer iron. They are made of molybdenum permalloy, a very special magnetic material. Its properties are very similar to that of small ferrites used in traditional core memory. As we explained in our previous videos, ferrite cores are mini bistable magnets. Due to their very square magnetization curve, the so-called Schmu plot, they always end up in a specific magnetic orientation. It's either a left-handed or a right-handed magnet, nothing in the middle. And moreover, it switches very abruptly from one orientation to the other. The change in magnetic orientation can simply be triggered by a short current pulse in a wire running through the core. The new magnetic orientation is retained after the pulse, and is usually what is used for storing data bits in core memory. But not so in core rope memory. The data is already encoded in a data wire position. If the bistable cores are not used for data retention, then what are they used for? They are used for address decoding and reading, and this time using an addressing scheme that is scalable and uses almost no electronics because the cores themselves perform the binary calculation for address decoding. Before we go there, let me explain the reading part, which is straightforward. Let's assume that we are able to flip the magnetic orientation of one and only one core. We'll explain how we do that later, but for now, assume that we manage to have all cores in one magnetic orientation, which we'll call reset, except for a single core in the opposite magnetic orientation, which we'll call set. Now let's add one more wire to our setup, called the reset wire, going through all the cores. We then feed a strong current in the reset wire, it produces a magnetic field that is sufficient to flip all the cores back to their reset position. Well, that will do nothing to the cores that were already reset, but it will suddenly flip the magnetization of the single core that was set. And since abruptly changing magnetic fields induce current in wires, this will induce a corresponding current pulse in all the data wires that went through this one and only core. If we strobe the sense amplifiers just at the right time, we will catch the pulses and read memory location 0, all 16 bits at a time. But the Apollo engineers went further. Let's redraw our 16 data wires as one single bundle called a strand. Also, the bundle line is drawn going through the middle of all cores. Use your imagination to picture that some of the wires actually go around the cores, just as before. Now let's add another strand of 16 wires. Actually, a bunch more, we'll add 12. I can't draw them all, but you get the picture. Now let's use an electronic switch between the 16 sense amplifiers and our strands, so we can connect the sense amps to any strand. Depending on the position of the switch, we can now choose to read one of the 12 strands. Nice trick! Each core can now store 12 words, which we can read all 16 bits at a time. That's a storage density of a whopping 192 bits per core. Each core now represents 12 memory addresses. The extra address bits will be controlling the strand selector switch. In the actual block 2 core rope, 
they had 512 cores. For a total of 512 cores times 12 strands times 16 bits, which makes our promise 12 kilobytes per module, an ocean of fixed memory. This core plane, each one of these cores is one bit, right. whereas in the AGC Block 2 rope, this core can be 192 bits, right. just this one core. <laughs> right. so, so that's why they selected that. Mm -hmm. The switch can be easily implemented with a classic diode switch, of the kind that we have already encountered in HP instruments and all floppy disk drives. Fortunately, diodes were already one of the smallest components at the time and they used them in droves in traditional core memory, so they all fit neatly right in the rope module. You can see all the diodes packed around the module depicted in black here. The red things are the resistors for biasing the diodes. Which finally leaves us with one last thing remaining to explain, which is how to set the one core we need to flip in order to read the many wires going through it. And that's where it gets even more complicated, so much so that even the original designers made a design error, the one that has now caught up with Mike. Naively, I thought one could use the same trick as one uses for conventional core memory, coincident current addressing. This exploits the property that a core should flip only if the current it sees is above some threshold. That works wonderfully well with regular core memory. You send half the flip current in a horizontal wire, the other half over a vertical wire, and only the one core at the intersection of the two wires will flip. Unfortunately, that does not work so well with the large cores used for core rope memory. That's because large cores cannot be made with ferrite material like the small cores, because the current necessary to flip such a scaled up core would be impractically large. Instead, as we already mentioned, the large cores are made with molybdenum permalloy. Molypermalloy is a metal alloy made of mostly nickel, some iron, and a few percent of molybdenum. This alloy, which was invented by Bell Labs in the 1940s and is still in use today, has an incredibly large magnetic permeability in the hundreds of thousands range. Thanks to its giant permeability, it takes about the same current pulse to flip a large moly core as it does to flip a minuscule ferrite, about 450 milliamps. This was well within the reach of transistor technology of the time. Since the core is made of a conductive metal, it is prone to eddy currents that will slow the flip transition to a crawl. In order to avoid that, the permalloy is thin into a ribbon just a few microns thick, and then wound up like a Baumkuchen cake. That kills the eddy currents which go orthogonal to the sheets, and the problem is solved. The orange color you see is just a protective epoxy coating. These cores are not ferrite. They're called tape-wound cores. They're made out of stuff called molybdenum permalloy. The way they did it is they made this incredibly thin tape out of molybdenum permalloy, one, one eighth of a mil thick. Having the thin tape reduces eddy currents when the core mm -hmm. is flipping, um, so it lets the core switch faster. We have on my little core rope test thing here, uh, one of these cores wired up. Uh, I've got three wires going through it. That will let us flip the core. Uh, so if you take a look at the oscilloscope, uh, we can show this core flipping back and forth. On the scope, sense, which is the signal we're looking for, set wire, reset wire, and go flip the cores. Okay. So if we hit the set wire, you can see the core flipping and the yellow trace. Okay, so that was set, Boop, went up, yep. and then the core flipped. Yep, right. if I do it again, you don't see the big the big right, so you, you still see a little bit that's just a cross-coupling from a transformer effect, mm -hmm. but what you're looking at is the middle and you, the computer would sample in the middle and would say, look, that core has not changed state. Right, yep, and it, it will keep doing that as long as I keep hitting mm -hmm. the set wire. Okay. And then if I hit the reset wire, the blue one, right? Yep, you can see the, the core flipped the other way around. Yeah, yep. and then if you do it more and more and more and more, it's just not going, yeah, so yep. we're back to where it's not flipping and we just, just get the cross talk. Right. So far, so good, we can flip these cores relatively fast with relatively low current. But there is a big problem. High permeability comes at the cost of less coercivity. The material is said to be magnetically soft. 
If you apply a half current, which would do nothing to a ferrite, the permalloy will instead start to demagnetize. Do it a few times and the core will progressively change its magnetic orientation. And that rules out the coincident current method, because cores that receive the half current would switch to an unknown state after a few pulses. So, why, why is it a rope memory? Um, instead of, you know, just like a regular core grid with bigger cores. Right. The answer is that these cores are softer than small mm -hmm. ferrite cores. Mm -hmm. I have another wire that is running through at half of the current. If I, if I pulse this half current a bunch of times and then I set the core again, you can see that it, it suddenly flips when it shouldn't have. Because the, of the way that these are magnetically softer, every time you pulse half current through the core, it slowly reverses the magnetic field of the core. Mm -hmm. Instead of going all the way at once, it just kind of makes it reverse mm -hmm. a little bit at a time. You magnetize it progressively. That's catastrophic. You know, if, if you're using the XY technique, mm -hmm. eventually some of them are going to flip enough to get picked up by your sense amplifiers. You can't do coincident current addressing. So you, you have to come up with a scheme that lets you put the full amount of current to flip the core through only one of them, and none of the other cores see enough current at all to begin magnetizing, which is hard. <laughs> and the scheme that they came up to, with to do that is, is why it's called rope memory. So core rope memory has to use a different core flipping scheme. Let's forget all of our data strands and our reset wire for clarity so we can concentrate on the addressing wires. Let's first add a set wire that goes through all the cores. When we pulse the set wire, we flip all the cores to the set magnetic state. But we want to flip only one core. For that, we are going to add inhibit wires to prevent other cores from flipping. Let's first reset everything by pulsing the reset wire. Now let's add an inhibit wire, which carries a current equal to the set current, but flowing in the other direction. Since the core is only sensitive to the net current going through it, that will cancel out the set current through half of the cores. Only the cores that are not inhibited will be set. Each inhibit wire will also have a corresponding anti-wire, so we can select the other half of the cores. The anti-inhibit is drawn in blue here. Let's try it. Turn inhibits off, reset the cores, turn on the anti-inhibit, pulse the set wire, and now we have flipped the other half of the cores. To make the drawing less messy, I won't bother to draw the blue anti-wires for the rest of the explanation, but keep in mind they are there. Now let's add a second inhibit wire that jumps two cores at a time. If we pair both inhibits and try again, we'll select only two cores. Note that some cores are doubly inhibited, they see net negative current. But the more inhibited the better, we just don't want them to experience any set current. Let's add a third inhibit wire that goes through half of the array now. Reset, set, and voila, we have finally managed to flip a single core. Our core rope addressing has succeeded. All we need to do now is to select a data strand with the other address bits, pulse our reset wire to flip the single core, and read the wires in that core. We have made core rope memory quite an accomplishment. So Mike has made a nice online visual simulator where you can experiment with the real block to core rope, which has 512 cores. You can activate the inhibits and the anti-inhibits and see what they do. Link it doodly do, but let's play with it. So I can try this inhibit. So it does half of the plane. And if I do the anti-inhibit, it does the other half of the plane, as you'd expect. And then when you go through the other ones, they sort of do what you expect, right? They uh, divide the core into a, a binary search pattern, uh, as we had explained before. So that's all fine and dandy. You can also set several at the same time and you can see how uh, the more inhibits I turn on the more inhibited some core become and of course the darker the core the more inhibit current it has in it. 
Uh, but you've probably already noticed that something is a little bit odd. There are only seven inhibit wire pairs, and if you know your binary, that only allows you to count to 128, and we have 512 cores, so we can't count the whole array independently, only address a quarter of it. And you can see it happening. If you look for the cores that are going to flip, they are the ones that are uninhibited, they are still white. So there is one, two, three, and four. So indeed, we have four cores selected. So what has happened is that the array has been divided into four subplanes that are all wired in parallel except for the reset wires for, of which they have one independent for each subplane. So let's try to reset uh, subplane A, then we'll see what it is. So this is subplane A, this is plane B, this is plane C, and this is plane D, all wired in parallel except for the resets. But very curiously, for the set wire, where you would expect four set wires, but there are only two. So let's try set AB, and it set a whole bunch of cores, so let's clear that. And set CD is the other half, and it, it did set uh, the two plain C and D at the same time, as the name implies. So we need to unset them like this. This reduction from four set wires to two set wires is something that happened between block one and block two. And it will soon cause us much grief, as you will see. Uh, so let's do again our selection here. I'll do all the inhibits. And we again got our four cores selected. And we are going to try a set AB and see what happens. So we should flip a few cores. All right. That did work. Disable all our wires. So here's the result. So as expected, instead of selecting one core, we selected two, which is not so good. And then something else happened. You can see all those red cores. And these cores are cores that are half set. So there is something more happening here, some additional witchcraft that we haven't talked about yet. And it has to do with an extra pair of inhibit wires that we haven't talked about yet the parity wire and its corresponding anti-wire. Let's try them out. Clear everything. So this is the parity wire. Okay, it seems to highlight a whole bunch of random cores. And this is the anti-parity wire and it's the inverse of the previous one. And what is it that Mike was saying earlier about the parity? I bet you I'm calculating the parity wire incorrectly. Aha, uh -huh. the parity inhibits are the ones that Mike is struggling with right now. We are on to something. So what are those parity wires all about? The parity inhibit is the ultimate core party trick gone wrong. It's a very clever trick that was supposed to reduce the inhibit wire's current by half from 450 milliamps to 225 milliamps. With so many inhibit wires, this is a significant power saving. Of course, if we were just to reduce the inhibit current by half without doing anything else, some cores would end up only half inhibited. And that's exactly what happened to us. Let's try it again. Set all or inhibit one to seven, set A, B, disable all wires. So now that you know all this, it starts to make more sense. We got our two flip cores because we can only count to 128. And then we are bound to have some half inhibited cores because we ran at half inhibit current. And we have at least seven of them per half plane, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Why seven? Because there are seven cores that differ by only one single address bit from the blue core we wanted to select. Therefore, the red cores have only one single inhibit wire activated going through them. And that wire is running at half current, so they end up half inhibited. The purpose of the parity inhibit 
is to correct for that problem. Since the seven problem cores differ by one bit address from the blue core we were targeting, their address parity is opposite from that of the blue core. So by adding a special pair of inhibit wires which threads through all the cores that have the same address parity, we can add another half inhibit to all the cores of opposite parity to our blue core, which of course include our seven offending red cores. Here is Mike demonstrating how to thread the inhibit wire. To find the parity of the address of a core, you simply count the number of inhibit wires that go through it. If it's odd, you thread the parity inhibit wire thread. If it's even, you skip it. Do the reverse for the anti-parity inhibit. So now that we are smarter, let's try it again and use the parity inhibit as we should and see if that fixes the problem. So let's do a clear set all of our, of our inhibits, select the anti-parity and uh, do a set AB and disable all wires. Okay, so that worked a lot better. It got the plane A perfect, no more half inhibited cores. And then it did something weird in the B plane. What happened is that the designers got carried away and added one trick to many. They also wanted to inhibit the second sister blue core in the plane B while they were at it using the same parity wire. Which did it, you can see it's been suppressed. How did they do that? They just included the AB bits to the parity wire count for the threading calculation, which made the sister B core of opposite parity than the plane A blue core. Perfect. However, it has a bad side effect. It flips the parity of the entire plane B. So now we fail to doubly inhibit the half set cores in the B plane, which was the original purpose of the parity wire. It's super obvious if you think of it and look at it with Mike's visual web tool, but sadly they didn't have Mike nor the web. So we end up with seven cores not fully inhibited in the B plane due to a design error. And that's a pretty sneaky fault. Depending on program execution, cores will progressively and randomly become partially flipped through the array and eventually give false readings. So they did not discover the issue until very late in the block two development cycle. Faced with tight deadlines, they went for a simple and blunt fix. They just activated the reset wire of the affected plane. It will add one notch of full inhibit current to the whole plane and patch away the issue. Let's try it. Reset B and here we go. It's dirty, it weighs 450 milliamps of power, but it works and takes only a few gates to implement. So they went for it, off to the moon they went before the decade is over. So finally, I can show you how to do a correct address selection cycle in a block two core module. Let's clear everything. Let's choose inhibit. So this time I'll do it a little bit differently. Select some anti-wires while I am at it. And now we know we need to use one of the parity wires and we also need to use one of the resets to patch up the design mistake. And let's use the set line and see if that worked. Woohoo! That was it. We finally did it. So um, we selected core 146. So uh, note that the simulation can do that automatically for you if you put a core address in octal. Over here, you do simulate selection and plum it did i think that must be core 16 there you go it did it for us and you can even simulate the whole cycle where it does the selection uh, flips the core and resets the array so up selected flip the core and we read the number 60. let's do it again old wire set reset and we read the core 60. Woo, congratulations, <laughs> you made it through one of the most complicated elevator music explanations I have ever done. And you may even be able to fix Mike's core reader problem. 
See, he can read some planes but not others. He quickly realizes that this is either related to a bad reset wire calculation or a bad parity wire calculation. Mike, yep. you already found a problem? I think so. What is it? Uh, I was calculating the parity inhibit wire off of the bottom seven bits of the address when I should have been doing it off of the bottom eight bits of the address. So what happened is that Mike calculated the parity selection correctly, omitting the AB bit, instead of doing it wrong like the designers had. So he just has to recompile his FPGA code to try to reintroduce the design mistake by including the AB bit and the CD bit in the parity wire activation. And hopefully, having reintroduced the faulty logic, we can now read our ropes. In Mike we trust, fingers crossed. Let's see if it likes that. <clears throat> You still use the zinc? No, this is an Artix 7, okay. I think. Yeah, and then I have a microblaze in it for the... Um, for the process. Yeah, right? for the communication with the, the laptop. But that, you know, it was just a very nice little form factor for an FPGA board. Mm -hmm. Okay, programming completed. Get this restarted. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, that's me. Okay, so power there, power to the rope. Now let's check we can still read address zero correctly. Two seven five three three one. Sounds good to me. Uh, address one, O seven five seven one. That's good. Okay, so let's check if we can now read two hundred. O three two seven one. That's correct. Okay. Will you so fix it? That should have fixed the problem. So we can try to read the whole rope again. Yay! Yay! Hey, green lights. And it's it successfully identified it as module B4 from Luminary 69 because all the all the bugger words were ah. what, what you know what was you specified. have that in your database. Yep. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> we did a okay. okay I, I vote for uh, sending Mike to the moon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Actually, you should you should uh, you, you should go on the team of the Boeing's team and they can't figure out their software. They, <laughs> they don't they don't they don't have a mic. That's their problem. <laughs> Congratulations, that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, this is, I've been working on this for quite a while, so it's it's very satisfying to see it working. <laughs> All right, well, Congrats. let's Thanks. dump some more. Yes. All right, let's stop here for this exhausting episode. My brain is fried. But I wanted to leave enough detail for the record to document how core op memory really works, which I have not seen correctly explained anywhere, except, of course, on Mike's website and to congratulate Mike on such hard work. We'll save the rope recovery adventures for a future episode. See you then!